Hi, everyone. Hi, Mireya. Nice to see you. Hi, Ruby. Hello, everyone. All right, I'm going to send out. Hi, Laylee. Hello, Adelis. Come and say hi in the chat. Amazing. So many people. Come say hi in the chat. Tell us something about yourself or where you're joining from or what you're excited about. We're talking about phrasal verbs in this webinar. All right, let me send this out to everyone so that they have it. All right, hello, hello. I see people saying hello in the chat. That's so great. Amazing. Just terrific. <laughs> Thank you, Poonam. That's very kind of you. I'm very happy that you're here joining live. So cool. Just out of curiosity, did you come in from advanced English or explaining, Poonam? Oh, so many wonderful people joining. So happy about that. Very cool. That's very kind, Poonam. Uh, Mireya, maybe try to refresh the page. Sometimes refreshing the browser helps. So just refresh. Okay, good. So this is just a public service announcement. If you feel like you can't hear or you're having audio issues, just refresh the page. That usually tends to work. Okay, good. Wonderful. Okay, so I am going to get started here. I'm going to share my screen. And as more people come in, that's fantastic. Um, okay, good. So today we're talking about phrasal verbs, which are very important when you want to speak fluently, speak fluidly, sound more like an L1 English speaker, understand native English speakers better, be able to understand fast talking people, um, and also enjoy your favorite shows, streaming, you know, streaming whatever you like, and being able to understand movies and film and even songs. So connected speech is definitely one of those things that help us with that, but also phrasal verbs. So mastering phrasal verbs is definitely going to do you a great service when you want to sound more fluent, more confident, increase and improve your communication skills, your confidence levels. So I'm going to share some today and we're going to talk about some strategies and We'll take it from there. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and share my lovely screen with you. Beautiful. All right, so here we are loading. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so as you know, we are talking about phrasal verbs. Um, also, I would love for you to make use of the chat, engage with it, send in your favorite emojis. If you have a question, ask it. If you want to engage with the material, this is a great way to do that in the interactive chat because that way you're, you know, participating and this is participatory. So it's interactive, right? Okay, excellent. Okay, so hello everyone. For those of you who are new, welcome. Um, those of you probably know me from, for those of you who've been before, uh, you know, been here before or just have come in from the YouTube channels or the Spotify um, and the podcast, you know me from Advanced English and Exploring, and I am head of community here at Exploring Academy. And I am co-founder of Exploring and Advanced English. So welcome, you are in the right hands. And I am here to help you improve your social fluency, being able to participate in social interaction across settings, across communication contexts, be it professional ones, personal ones, social ones, business setting, here to help you increase and improve your confidence, boost your executive communication, uh, 
communication strategies, and social fluency. So that's what we do here. And I'm so happy that you're joining us. And if you really enjoy the podcast, you are given an opportunity to give it up to five stars on pot on Spotify, which is so cool. It really helps us out. So just as a little reminder, if you haven't done so already, you know, we put out a lot of free content and it's a nice way of kind of, you know, just giving back in a way, right. And just showing your appreciation for it. If, if you do enjoy it and help us get it out to more people, which is the goal so that we can help more people improve their confidence, communication, and social fluency. Okay, so a little bit about my background. I have an advanced master's from Columbia University. Um, I have another master's from Bacchagir University, and I have an undergrad in both French and communication. So yes, I am also multilingual. I learned languages after my you know, L1 English, I'm a native English speaker, and I've learned languages after that. So I, I completely understand the process of learning a language. Not only that, I also went to school to learn applied linguistics, and I've taught in the classroom for over 15 years. Um, I've over a decade in cross-cultural corporate communications. I've also done professional broadcasting, live broadcasting and television. Um, and I've been teaching and designing courses in communication, social skills, public speaking, executive communication, business communication, and cross-cultural communication for over 15 years. So this is something that I'm very passionate about and have a lot of experience with. Um, I really like leveraging technology, using empirical research, and data-backed teaching methods for high-value student outcomes. And I have also uh, an extensive background in teacher training. So teaching, tra training teachers how to teach. Um, and I've done that abroad. I've done it at Columbia University, Baruch College, Hunter College, and all of those are in New York as well. So that's just a little bit about me. I'm a New Yorker, born and bred. We can say born and bred or born and raised. I'm multicultural. I uh, speak Turkish and French fluently, and I'm learning Greek. I'm a global citizen. I love to travel and I've worked and I've lived abroad. So again, I'm telling you this because I have a lot of experience with navigating cross-cultural and intercultural communication settings. I've learned more than one language. I think it's extremely important for us to know and speak more than one language um, and know it well, whatever languages we are learning. And um, overall to improve our communication skills. Okay, so we're going to talk about what are phrasal verbs, intro, what are phrasal verbs, why are they important, some common phrasal verbs, and some tips and strategies for mastering phrasal verbs, because that's important too, right? Okay, so with that, welcome again to today's presentation. We're going to talk about mastering phrasal verbs in English, which are an essential part of the English language, but they can be very tricky to master, right? And if you've come across phrasal verbs or have heard them, you can you might be nodding your heads right now, right? And so that's why we're here today to help you become a phrasal verb pro. So what are phrasal verbs? They are two or three worded phrases that have a verb and one or more particles, right? So they can be confusing because their meaning is often different from the individual words that make them up. But don't worry, we're gonna break it down for you and give you some tips and tricks for match mastering these important language tools. How does that sound? Do I get a thumbs up in the chat? Let me know how we're doing. How does that sound so far? Okay, great. Nice, thumbs up from Medea. I love it. Okay, good. So let's carry on, shall we? Okay, so they're a type of verb, right? That consists of a main verb and then one or more prepositions or adverbs. For example, get, give up, put off. These are common phrasal verbs in English. You might've heard them before, right? Give up, put off. 
they can be challenging for English learners because their meetings can be idiomatic and not always predictable based on the individual words, meaning the individual words that make them up will have separate meanings often, but when they come together, they might have a different meaning. And that's what makes them very confusing. But when you do master phrasal verbs and start getting into the mindset of hearing phrasal verbs, being on the lookout for them, you will start to communicate more effectively, understand better, and be a little bit more fluent and communicative, okay? Okay, so why are they important? Well, they are critical and crucial for mastering English. Why? Because they enable a more nuanced and natural expression. Americans, I can speak for Americans because I am American, we use phrasal verbs a lot. This is a very natural part of our communication. So you definitely want to keep them in mind, right? They're a very natural way of expressing ourselves. They convey subtle meanings beyond simpler vocabulary. So you will also be, you know, equipping yourself with some nicer phraseology, right? So for example, put up with, it means to tolerate or endure something that is unpleasant. So that's one of them, right? And that's three words, right? So knowing phrasal verbs will definitely enhance your fluency and the natural naturalness, right? The rhythm, the naturalness, the subtlety, and the nuance as well. Okay. So how are we doing? Does that all make sense to everyone? What are our thoughts with that? Tell me in the chat. I see some people typing, so let's see. All right. So let's have a look here. Let's complete these two, compare these two phrases, okay? So we've got Sam doesn't like his job, but he has to deal with it. Okay, that's interesting. Here's another way of phrasing that, right? Sam doesn't like his job, but he has to put up with it, right? So which one has the phrasal verb in it? One or two? You wanna let me know in the chat? Which one has the phrasal verb? One or two? All right, let's see, let's see. Okay, I see some people chatting here, typing in the chat, very good. So, ready for the answer? It's two, to put up with, right? Put up with, put up with, okay. So, common phrasal verbs. Let's have a look. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into these. Okay. So, take off, right? This is a phrasal verb that means to remove or lift something from a surface. So, it consists of the verb take and the preposition off. So, for those of you who said both in the previous example, don't confuse them with prepositions right? Um, Because sometimes you'll have a verb and then a preposition, but sometimes you'll have a phrasal verb, which yes, it consists sometimes of prepositions as well. But in most cases, takeoff is separable. Okay, so the object can come between the verb and the preposition and you can put something else in there. So she took the book off the shelf. So they don't have to come just right back to back. They can be separated, separated, separable verbs. She took the book off the shelf. She took off the book from the shelf would be a little bit less natural, right? We don't really say that. She took the book off the shelf, took off the shelf, okay? Context matters. So of course, you are going to keep that in mind, okay? So the literal usage, first is the literal usage. So it's used literally, meaning we're removing clothing or an object from a surface, All right? He took off his hat when he came back indoors. She took off her nail polish because she didn't like the color anymore. He took off his jacket before entering the house. Okay, so that's the literal meaning, literal usage. 
Then we've got figurative. Okay. So this is when we want to indicate a sudden increase of success increase of something or success the company's sales really took off after the new product launch right the company's sales really took off after the product launch her youtube channel took off after she published those amazing videos or something like that right so you can when you experience success and increase in something, you can say to take off and that's figurative. Okay. Then we've got the aircraft meeting. So meaning in aviation take off is when the moment the aircraft becomes airborne, right? It's in the air. It becomes airborne at the start of a flight. So Sira said the plane took off at 6am. Exactly. That's a great example, right? Take off landing. So the plane took off at 6 a.m. Or prepare for takeoff. Okay, the airplane is scheduled to take off at 9 p.m. So don't miss it. Don't miss the flight. Okay. Informal conversation. So you might hear this, although it's not as common, I would say, but you might hear it. And this is an informal conversation where take off the phrasal verb take off can also mean to imitate right or mimic someone in a playful or joking or mocking way so let's look at an example of that he's great at taking off celebrities mimicking their voices and gestures so he's good at mimicking them and imitating them and it sounds quite believable let's say, right? He's great at taking off celebrities. So when you hear that, you might say, well, what does that mean? But this is an expression. And yes, it just so happens to have a phrasal verb in it. So you might, you might hear that. Again, not as frequent, but you might potentially hear that. Idiomatic expressions like take off, right? So the project success took off a huge load from my shoulders, right? Take off a huge load, uh, load of, off your shoulders or from your shoulders can be like a huge relief. Like, oh, I'm so glad that launch is over with. That was a huge, that, that was a huge load off my shoulders or it took off a huge load from my shoulders. So it's like, imagine, you, you know, you're carrying a heavy load and you're, the, the, the weight of it is really, you know, your, your shoulders can feel that weight. That's kind of where that expression comes from. So the project success took off a huge load from my shoulders. That's a good one, right? So you'll see these also in idiomatic expressions. And of course, those can be a little bit trickier because it's not only the phrasal verb in there, but also the idiomatic expression, right? To take a load off of one's shoulders or take a load off from, uh, take off from one's shoulders. Both are correct. Okay, so let's have a look. We're going to choose an option A, B, C, or D. So I would love for you to write in the chat what you think. So let's have a look. What does the phrasal verb take off mean in the sentence? The rocket is scheduled to take off at dawn. Okay, ready? Is it to remove clothing or an object from a surface? Is it to suddenly increase or achieve success? Is it to imitate someone humorously or playfully? Or is it to become airborne at the start of a flight? So notice how these are all the definition, can be the definition of takeoff. But in this example, I'll go back to it if you'd like. In this example, we're talking about the rocket is scheduled to take off at dawn. The rocket is scheduled to take off at dawn. Okay, so what do we think? A, B, C, or D? I'll give you a second to chat. Write your answer in the chat. Okay, the rocket is scheduled to take off at dawn. The answer is D. 
right? So the rocket is going to, is preparing for liftoff or takeoff, and it's going to become airborne at the start of the flight. So the answer is D. Generally, typically speaking, when we're talking about things being airborne, right? So rockets, airplanes, we use takeoff to indicate that it's going to be airborne when the flight starts, right? Okay, good. Give up. This is another phrasal verb. So the example here, after many failed attempts, she decided to give up on learning the piano. Ugh. Has anyone had a situation like that where they've started a, you know, a hobby or they got pretty good in a certain skill, but then for whatever reason, decided to give up on it and stop progressing and stop continuing? Like in this case with many failed attempts, she decided to give up on learning the piano. So it sounds like it wasn't going that well, right? Failed attempts. So, but, you know, maybe giving up is not the answer. I don't know. That's a separate question. But anyway, we have this phrasal verb. So to give up, which means to stop trying to quit something because of typically due to challenges or difficulties or obstacles that are insurmountable maybe or perceived to be insurmountable and we've got the verb give and the preposition up right give up so it typically implies a sense of negativity or resignation but not always in this sentence yes it does imply that negativity, resignation, right? It was too hard. So she decided to give up. She didn't persevere. She didn't have grit with this situation. Okay. Again, of course, context matters. And the first usage is to surrender, right? It's used to indicate yielding in a conflict or in a competition. Abandon, right? Good. That's right, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that in the chat. Right. So the team decided to give up after falling behind by a large margin. So they gave up because it was just, they had too many points that they would have to have obtained to get tied with the other team or to win. So they just gave up because they were really behind by a long shot, by a large margin. Then we've got to quit trying, right? It's commonly used when someone stops pursuing a goal or a passion or a hobby or an endeavor because of obstacles or lack of progress. So when the person feels like there's not that perceived progress, they feel like they've stagnated or they're simply not improving anymore, they might give up. And that's really sad because progress is still being made, right? Progress is not linear. It's more like this, right? So there'll be ups and downs, but even though the trajectory is facing up. But if somebody doesn't feel that way, then they might give up. And that's that's too bad. She didn't want to give up on her dream of becoming a doctor. She did not want to give up on her dream of becoming a doctor. She didn't want to abandon her dream of becoming a doctor, right? So she persevered and she studied really hard. She did really well in her exams. How are we doing so far? Can I get an emoji in the chat? How are we doing? All right, nice. Thumbs up from Laylee. Smiley face from like happy face. I don't even know what that emoji exactly is. I love that emoji, but I don't even know what that is exactly. But it's a great emoji, Adelis. Thank you. Thumbs up from Sira. Amazing. Okay, good. What else do we have here? Yay, clapping from Mireya. Okay. Bad habit. So it can refer to quitting a bad habit, like smoking or unhealthy eating or no exercise or whatever else there might be. Um, so he finally gave up smoking after years of struggling with it. He finally gave it up. He gave up smoking. He gave it up, gave it up, gave it up, right? In connected speech. That was, that's how it would sound. Okay. Effort. 
So it can be used to convey the idea of abandoning effort. So Sira mentioned earlier, abandon, right? That's it. Abandoning effort or not putting in any more work, like done, right? Giving up on that thing for whatever reason, generally because of obstacles. Don't give up now, you're almost there. So this is the funny part, right? I, a lot of times when we're about to give up or we decide to give up, we're just on the edge of something great. And that always kind of thinks, you know, makes me think a little bit because it's like, okay, if you're feeling like you wanna give up, maybe just push that little bit harder, that go that extra mile just for a little longer because you could be on the edge of something really great. And if not, then time will show that and you know you can throw in the towel. Um, but just just this little side note because giving up maybe is appropriate in some contexts, like it could be a sunk cost. But in other contexts, maybe it's like, well, just push that little further and see where it goes because you could be on the precipice of something wonderful. Okay, let's have a look at this multiple choice. So what does a phrasal verb give up mean in this specific sentence? Okay, so this is context dependent, which is what we said, right? So despite facing challenges, she refused to give up on her dream of becoming an astronaut. Okay, so keep that in your mind as we have a look at the options. Is it to hand over something willingly? Is it to offer help or assistance? Is it to let go of something physically? Is it to stop pursuing a goal or endeavor? So A, B, C, or D, what do we think? What do we think? Okay, I see some answers coming in in the chat. All right, are you ready to see the answer? D, pursuing a goal or endeavor, right? She didn't wanna give up on becoming an astronaut. She didn't wanna stop pursuing her goal of becoming an astronaut. Anybody out there wanna become an astronaut as a little kid? Or even now, you know, not just as a little kid. Anybody ever want to be an astronaut or go into deep space or anything like that? I definitely had an astronaut phrase. I remember in science, I think it was in the fourth or fifth grade, we were learning um, about space and the planets and all of that. And I just remember thinking, oh, it would be so cool to be an astronaut. And I still love space movies. Like that's one of my favorite things to Space movies, space shows, gosh, love that stuff. Sci-fi, so astronauts. So, oh yes, you know, your son, right? Yeah, so there you go. Some people, some people want to be astronauts. Why not? Okay, ready for the next one, run into. I unexpectedly ran into an old friend at the grocery store. This is one of my favorite phrasal verbs, running to, bump into, Run, run into someone. So it's a phrasal verb that means to unexpectedly meet or encounter someone or something by chance, right? You didn't plan it. It was just spontaneous. It happened. It's cool. It's fun, right? You bump into your old friend or you run into your neighbor and have a coffee together on your way back from the grocery store. So we've got the verb run and the preposition into, right? Run into. Chance and unplanned, right? It's just unplanned. And accidental nature of the encounter. You didn't plan it. That's the fun part. It just happened. Again, context matters. So as you see for all of these, with phrasal verbs, context absolutely matters. So you've got to pay attention to the who, what, where, when, why, right? Really think about what's going on. What is the intention of the speaker, right? Who is uttering this phrase and what is their intention? What do you glean from this? 
So that's a good kind of mindset to be in. Ask, question the context. So the first usage, to encounter people, right? When you come across, that's another phrasal verb, come across. When you come across someone you know or you meet someone unexpectedly. And again, it's a synonymous with bump into or bump in, bump into, run into, um, another one of my favorites. I think I just love that spontaneity, right? That unplanned nature of bumping into a friend or running into someone that you know. I ran into Sarah at the coffee shop yesterday. It was so cool to see her. I hadn't seen her in weeks. Really fun to run into her. We've got to encounter situations. So describe unexpectedly encountering a situation, often implying challenges or difficulties. So this is a separate meaning, right? Very different from the first one. So this is when you run into issues or problems. So you're setting up a new software on your computer and you, you ran into some issues. You ran into some problems. They were unexpected. You weren't. So this is not as fun, right? This spontaneous running into is not as fun as running into a friend. <laughs> Unless you like solving challenges with software. Maybe, maybe you're a developer and you love doing that. But the point here is that you see how the context is very different, right? Amounts or numbers. So run into can refer to facing or exceeding a particular number or amount. The project's costs have run into the thousands of dollars. So exceeding, right? Getting into another threshold. So that's also not the best thing, right? But you see again, same phrasal verb, totally different meaning. The project's costs have run into the thousands of dollars. So we are over budget. Informal and conversational, right? This is what we would normally see in more of the conversational and informal settings. You might come across it at work. That's another phrasal verb, like I mentioned, come across. But you're definitely safe to use this in informal and conversational contexts. Run across is another variation on the theme in this situation, except for that first one, when you physically run into someone, well, not, not physically in the sense that you, you know, run into them and cause impact, but you bump into them, right? That's the same meaning with the first one where you ran into Sarah at the coffee shop, you bumped into Sarah at the coffee shop, but you can't, say for this one let's say the project's costs have bumped into right that wouldn't make sense so here you would have to keep it as run into run into but for this one i happen to run across an interesting article online here you can use run across right i ran across an interesting article online that i want to share with you okay so now let's have a look at an example. Again, context dependent. So what does the phrasal verb run into mean in this sentence? While taking a walk, I ran into my neighbor from two streets over. To intentionally meet someone for a conversation, to unexpectedly encounter someone or something, to physically bump into someone something accidentally, to plan a meeting with a friend. All right, I see lots of nice answers coming in the chat. Thank you all for participating. All right, let's see, let's see. I have a couple more people chatting. I wanna give them an opportunity to type their answer before I go to the next slide. All right, the answer, drum roll please, B. Right, the operative word there is unexpectedly encounter, right? Unexpectedly, it's not planned, you encounter somebody unexpectedly, spontaneously. 
Excellent. Okay. So I've got a few tips for you. When you come across some phrasal verbs, keep these in mind because this is going to help you start to build your arsenal of phrasal verbs one at a time. So for, focus on one verb at a time. Don't try to overwhelm your senses and your cognitive capacity with trying to memorize. Again, I'm not a fan of memorization. That's temporary. Internalization is what we strive for, right? Internalizing. And that really only comes, that comes with practice, 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 and exposure, of course. So, you know, the great way to do this is you would start by choosing common phrasal verbs such as look up and then practice it using it in different contexts, right? As we know, phrasal verbs are very much context dependent. So until you feel comfortable with its meaning and its usage, then, you know, you, you keep doing it until you really feel more at ease with it. And it just rolls off the tongue. Like you don't even have to think too much about it. And you know what context to use those phrasal verbs in. Reading. Reading is a fabulous way of not only boosting your vocabulary, but also starting to get more familiar with phrasal verbs and knowing what are phrasal verbs versus what are verbs that just happen to be next to prepositions, right? Just because a verb is next to a preposition does not make it a phrasal verb. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So I really encourage you to read whatever kind of content you'd like to read, read. It could be long form, like, you know, extensive articles or research papers or books and novels, um, even comic books. Uh, or you could read shorter, you know, short form or like blog posts and shorter articles. And I want you to pay attention to how they're used in the context, right? First of all, check to see if it is a phrasal verb. And then make sure you understand how it's being used in the context. Maybe write that sentence down where you find it. What's the environment that you see it in? Meaning what are the other words there? What's the linguistic environment? What does it come before? What does it come after? This is gonna help you start developing your intuition, right? Your intuitive sense of how phrasal verbs work, what context you should use them in, how you can express them across various meanings, what are the nuances, what phrasal verb could you replace with another phrasal verb, like bump into, run into, things like that, okay? That's how you're gonna start. And of course, practicing, practicing, well, you know how people say practice makes perfect. I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on us for perfect, perfect. Instead, I really like practice makes progress. So practice makes progress. It's essential when you want to become more fluent, more conversational, even more socially fluent in English. It's used very frequently, right? In everyday conversation, we see them in business settings. We hear them in conversational social settings as well, right? They're across these sentences and they can greatly enhance your ability to communicate effectively, as we know. So you've got to practice using them in context. This is how you're going to start internalizing them. Just memorizing a list of phrasal verbs is not going to do you much good. You've got to use them. You've got to practice them in the context and really make use of them that way. And if you'd like to practice them, if you'd like to practice your communication in general, practice your social skills, we've got a plan for that. Practice your executive communication and work on ex executive excellence. We have a plan for that. So, the power of community. It's an amazing, amazing phenomenon. Community. We, you know, we, I want to say grew up in tribes, but back, way back when we lived in caves, right? We were part of tribes. We were part of communities. That is how we survived. We did not survive alone. We survived with the community and we grow with community, right? So you've got support, You've got practice, you've got confidence building, 
that you're going to notice too. Not just other people will notice, but you will notice, which will in turn help you become even better at whatever else you're doing, be it professional, be it, you know, I have people come in and say, I want to learn how to be a better human. And I'm, you know, you're in the right place. So really, really important. You can join an English speaking community. You can practice all of the skills in addition to social skills and communication. Like I said, not just social skills, but executive communication and excellence. We've got a plan for that. Improving communication skills, thinking on your feet, impromptu speaking, knowing how to say what and what to say, not just what to say, but how to say it. Um, and of course, phrasal verbs and idiomatic expressions are a part of that because this is what we need. This is part of the language building blocks. So we've got an Exploring Academy plan. Uh, you, there are certain things in there and you've got $10 a month for that. So that's one thing that you can join. Or if you want to upgrade and have lots of calls with us, then you can join the Executive Communication Lab and that's more focused on, you know, people who are working in English or they want to, they're not necessarily working in an English speaking country yet, but maybe they want to, or they're using English for their business uh, or their whatever line of work they're in, and they want to have that professional polish. And I'll tell you, a lot of people also join this to learn the strategies of executive communication and then apply it to their own languages, their own L1 languages. So I've got people coming in here, learning the strategies, and then not just using them in English, but also in their L1 native language. So giving work presentations, knowing how to, you know, present yourself, give an elevator pitch, how to answer that interview question, you know, tell me about yourself, how to speak with assertiveness and confidence. Uh, so many topics that we dive into. And um, that's in addition to the social skills. So that's something that you might consider if you are, you know, looking to get a job abroad or speak in, um, you know, work in an English speaking country or make use of your English in your home country in a professional context. So that's something that you can do. I love this African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's like when you go up the mountain with a group of people, right? Going up by yourself is it's okay. Like maybe, yeah, maybe you go pretty fast. Maybe you you have a you know fast gait, but it's so much more fun to do it in a group. And you definitely go much farther together. So that's uh, a great metaphor for our community. So if you want to come up the mountain with us, then you might want to join. Not to mention all of the learning that happens, learning from others. Our members are phenomenal. I'm, I'm constantly blown away by them and impressed by them. Kind, caring, fascinating, very smart, uh, wonderful people, and curious too, right? We're all on the quest of learning and on the journey of lifelong learning. So I would so recommend for you to join and not just be able to chat with me, but with them, right? We learn so much from each other and it's an incredible place to be. What are people saying? Mireya says, best investment. You won't regret it. Nice and sweet and to the point. I love it. So it's, it's as she says, it's an investment, right? And you've got to decide to invest in yourself or to invest in other things. And if you are serious about improving your communication and social fluency and executive communication, then this might be the thing for you to do. This might be your sign to invest. Start with a $10 plan, right? That's less than two fancy lattes or a, a Netflix subscription. <laughs> oh, Mireya is here. She says, absolutely true. Yeah, love, love that. Love that from you, Mireya. Um, but it's it's a great, it's it's very true. Um, Helder said that you know he had to give a presentation at work and he used the tips from the community and everybody loved it. So in this case, he used that not just in English, but in his L1 of Portuguese. Um, 
and he loves that this community is different because it's not just about learning English. It's also focusing on practical communication skills that are relevant to your life and to your real life situations. So everything that we learn in the community and that you get that you, you know, that we teach in the community, you take that into real life, right? Not to say that our interactions aren't real life, that's still in real life, but you know what I mean? Like being able to take that into the boardroom or at home or with your friends, like knowing how to communicate and do it well. Okay. Maravis says that Exploring the Academy is very different from any training that she's attended so far, any professional training. Talking in small groups is something she really likes. Everyone in the group participates and the conversations that we have increases her self-confidence right? And being able to speak in different social situations, not just social settings, but, you know, business settings. Um, and she feels very encouraged to be able to speak and everyone benefits. Edwin says that the style of interaction at Exploring Academy is cutting edge and incorporates elements of teaching, innovative elements of teaching a second language, because we also focus very much on communication skills, right? That is what we do. Um, he says his speaking has improved in his daily interactions and he's overcome those typical language barriers, right? We talk about cultural barriers, language barriers, linguistic barriers, things like that, right? Where communication might be um, met with some difficulties, but this is what we work on, right? And, and being able to overcome those obstacles is such an amazing feeling. It's so liberating. Um, every day in live discussions, he learns new words, expressions, discussion items, which then he uses again in real life settings. Raquel, I don't get to use English in my daily life, so I find it very enriching to have the opportunity to exchange with people from different countries and to learn about their customs and opinions on current affairs. That is an incredible thing, right? Because we live in a global society and being able to communicate with people from all over the world, understand their worldview, their perspectives, their customs, their culture is such an empowering thing because the world is only going to get more global, which is a good thing, right? And we need to know how to navigate cross-cultural and intercultural contexts with ease, with finesse. This is also part of the social fluency that we talk about and that we work on. So very powerful, very, very empowering. Uh, and she also loves that the small groups that we have, you know, our community is growing, but we keep it to small groups when we're in our small group coaching sessions. So you get to interact with people, you get that social interaction, which is key for working on communication skills or improving a language. And then, you know, overcoming that fear of public speaking or diminishing that social anxiety. Very, very, very important as well. Saval says that everyone's very sweet and smiling in the community. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, right? She feels like her communication skills have been improved as well as her language skills. And she loves getting feedback, the corrective feedback, which we, of course, get to do. Ishika, Ishika's here. She's a native English speaker and she's here. Her goal in joining is to become more socially savvy and build that social emotional intelligence. So uh, it's great to have her. We love being able to, you know, work on those skills because that is something that we would do heavily. So it's not just for people who are second language learners of English, but also people who uh, are native English speakers because everyone can improve communication. This is a communication course and platform, right? And in the process of improving your communication, of course, you improve your language skills. Absolutely. And the also really cool part about that is that you get to improve your communication skills and also your L1 native language. So if you are a Spanish speaker, an L1 Spanish speaker, you can use the strategies that we teach in the community and that we practice in the community, not only in English, but also in Spanish. So two birds, one stone, right? Also very incredible. So again, as a recap, $10 a month, 
for one of our plans. And then if you want to upgrade, you can do the $50 a month executive communication plan. Um, Mireya says there's so much to do in the exploring community. Absolutely. Yeah. There you'll, you'll never get bored. <laughs> uh, there's constantly something for you to do, not just the live workshops, but we've got web courses, we've got interactive quizzes, we've got, um, you know, quests and challenges and you can sign up for the conversation partner program. So you get to chat with people in the community doing video calls, uh, join little groups. You have an option in, in some of our spaces to actually create your own event and invite people to that event. So if you want to do a book club in your time zone, you put that out there and you have the opportunity to create your own event and do it on our platform. Um, or if you want to do, you know, something else like a knitting club or whatever, whatever it might be, there's, there are so many options. Um, so that's it. Thank you for your time. More importantly, thank you for taking the time to invest in yourself over the past 53 minutes. You know, it's, it's going to make a huge difference participating in webinars like these, but also when you get the chance and you feel up to it, joining one of our paid plans. So you get that extra uh, support, you know, on the days where you kind of feel down, you know, you rely on community. You rely on the people there to lift each other up. Um, so thank you so much. Wonderful to have you here. Great job. Nice work participating. I really appreciated it. And yes, you're so welcome to all of you. I will see you very soon in the next one.